Okay, my friends, this is going to be fun. We are looking for the tiniest particles that exist in the universe. Now they're calling them neutrinos. Now let's see what she has to say about neutrinos and see if we can come up with any kind of solid evidence. Here's what they're finding different neutrinos. They, they just change their, their, their look to them and they're sort of confused about it. Let's see if we can see if we can shed light on it. <laughs> this is all about light. Here we go. Imagine you're running a marathon. You high-five someone at the first mile marker and they see you as a human, normal. You high-five someone else at the 10 mile mark and now they see you as a panda. And when you high-five someone at the finish line, you're a honey badger. Bizarre, yes. But this is the strange phenomenon called oscillation that scientists found in neutrinos. Much like a human suddenly appearing as a honey badger, neutrino oscillations were unexpected. They're proof that our understanding of the particle world isn't finished. So, today on Even Bananas, let's talk about how experiments study neutrino oscillation. Okay, let's just do that. This is Kirsty Duffy. This is Fermilab. We're going to see if we can make any sense of this. Now, this is very complicated, but it's, I think I can make it fairly simple. This is a red pulsed laser. All right, we're right at the leading edge of the laser, catching it just as it's coming through the air. And that is where a particle exists. And the particle has a magnetic field surrounding it. So as it comes through the air, everybody else that has any magnetism to them, and every single thing there is, has electrons. So they are going to be pushed by this electron. And what electron am I talking about? I'm talking about these electrons right here. The white ones are the electron neutrinos, and the black ones are the muon neutrinos. You see that? Now, she's going to be talking about the thing changing from a honey badger to a person and so forth. They don't look like this until they are just ready to explode. And they explode right here at the Venturi. The black will separate from the white. The white is the electron showers, and the black is the muon, which is never changes. It stays a black ball. We can see that the light has accelerated. We can see that the particle was there and now has crashed into the Venturi. This is where the particle, which is the muon and electron neutrino attached, changes phases three different times. We saw it, and that's exactly what Fermilab says. Okay, these are the three phases that we have seen. There may be more, but we have seen three. It's the laying down flat angle. Then it's the straight up and down angle. And then it's the box. This one turned into a box a little bit early. <laughs> it, because it's right in the center. And these are not as concussed as the center ones. Now, here they explode and divide. The black turn comes away from the white. So what does that tell us about these three different phases. What is actually happening? This is light, remember. This is not photons. This is the smallest particles basically that exist as light. And right now, nobody understands light. At Fermilab, I'm going to tell you the honest truth, they don't think light is a particle. I'm showing light as a particle. They think light is a wave. They think it doesn't, it's not even a particle. Don Lincoln, I had interacted with him a little bit, and then he walked away from me because he thinks I'm a crazy guy, but he refuses to look at this. He said, I won't spend a minute. Now, how can you possibly come up with a decision without spending one minute? I need a minute, Don. Please. This is important. This is serious stuff. That is your muon, neutrino, in the one phase, and bef before th then it turns into the flat phase, and then it turns into the box phase, and then it divides. And this is what you're looking for. Right? I think I've shown it. Now, I'm going to show you something about the neutrino theory of light, because light is light. It's basically smallest particles, and neutrinos are part of light. Now, this goes back 50 years ago. This was my paper I wrote, and it's pretty dog-eared, because I, I refer to it a lot, because it, uh, it details the, the reason that there is no such thing as a solid 
positive nucleus and little electrons. It doesn't work. Everything has to be made of dipoles. And trust me, I did this. Where do you see the, uh, the reasoning behind this theory? Now listen to this. Neutrino theory of light is the proposal that the photon, which I showed you as light is a photon, is a composite particle formed of a neutrino, anti-neutrino pair, which I showed you, the black and white ball. It is based on the idea that emission and absorption of a photon corresponds to creation and annihilation of particles. Blah, 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 blah. The neutrino theory of light is not currently accepted as part of mainstream physics according to the standard model, which does not work. It doesn't, standard model doesn't even know what gravity is. It doesn't know what light is. It doesn't know if light is a particle or a wave. It, uh, anyway, it's an elementary particle and so forth. But look, at, this is the theory. This is the reasoning. Now, look at this. You see all this stuff? This is how they come up with their theory. The composite photon field. Well, let's just do a little of this and a little of this nonsense, okay? I did all this. I know how to do this stuff. It's just it's nonsense, absolute nonsense. And you go down. This is how they figure problems with the neutrino theory. Well, let's just throw in a few of these Ks and... And it goes on and on and on. They're, how are we going to solve this problem? Well, we're throwing a few more P's and K's and F's and dashes and Q's. And, and, I, and I, now, see, I'm, I'm criticizing them. I did all this. I'm not criticizing them because I don't know what they're doing. I'm criticizing because I do know what they're doing, and it's nonsense. It makes no sense whatsoever. You need dipoles. You need dipoles. I did this for 50 years. I know all about this stuff. Anybody wants to talk to me, I am 100% willing to, to correspond with anybody about anything. I did this a lot, trust me. I, and I did all the calculations. I did all the lab work and the, the heat, you know, how heat exchanges and everything. Everything came out to be electronic vapor. I called it, oh boy, it was the... Um, Atomic vapor. Oh, I, I said, well, it's in here somewhere. I said light turns into atomic vapor. That was my conclusion. Anyway, it's in here somewhere. I show, I show this a ton of times. And, and I show all the different things. It's my chance to brag. I did all this stuff. I did, and then the chemical forces, all chemical forces are electrostatic. All right? Everything is electrostatic. It's all negatives and positives. But we never realized that on an electron, there was not just an electron, there was that black part. It's never been seen before. That's the dark matter. That's the muon. I believe I've shown it. I understand all of this crazy nonsense they have to do to come up with, with a theory that supports something that wasn't right in the first place, which is Protons and neutrons make a nucleus. They do not. Electrons make a nucleus. That's the electron flood theory, which I've had for many, many years now. And I think I can support it much, much better than the current model, which is the, the uh, Bohr model, the standard model. Now, all we're using is a smartphone to pick up these... these um, particles. And it's, it, it, everybody's doing it. It's not just us. This was, goes back to 2014. They were using smartphones to look for cosmic rays. Well, cosmic rays are high energy particles. Exactly what we're seeing, high energy particles. Okay, so back to neutrinos. I say that the black ball is the muon neutrino, the white ball is the electron neutrino. Together they form an electron. That's what they are. We always thought it was just the electron was the white part because we never saw the black part. And the black part is dark matter. And they've been looking for that too. So here we got the, the electron neutrino turns into a shower. The black ball is the new muon neutrino. It just doesn't change at all. It just gets away from the white one. When we put it through a tuned Venturi, now we're going to look at that very closely in a second, but this could be the tau thing they're talking about. I'm not going to speculate, but I, this is the only thing I've seen like this, and it appeared to be a backward spinning particle. These are the Higgs fields, and this was like an anti-Higgs field, and it turned out to make whatever that is. I have no clue. But we're going to talk about these new, uh, these neutrinos changing their look as they move along, just like Kirsty uh, Duffy was talking about. All right, I'm just going to explain to you quickly how this whole thing transpires. It's called electron flood theory, and laser 
pulse laser is putting out these little particles which are the photons. It's light. Light is light. They're photons. Now, we can see that it accelerates. We can see that the particles separate, which I'll show you in a second, and we can see they come back together. Now, the reason they separate is because of a tuned venturi. It appears the white particles can get through that that little slit and the black ones cannot. And they go around. And here is the the proof of that. That is the particle, a wave. So the particle is here. The wave is the magnetic region that the particle influences. So you have a wave coming through influenced because there's a magnetic particle there. Now, because of the tuned venturi, it's basically like a, a squirting of a hose, but it pulls the particle right out of the wave, obviously accelerating, obviously a particle, obviously increasing enormously, exponentially in energy as it hits here. That's like an atomic bomb going off. Now, why can we see this wave? But we never saw these waves until they, they are being reverse concussed by this explosion. This one's being forward concussed into the air, so it's just barely glowing. So there's very little energy here. These, look at them glow. We never even knew they were here. You never ever were going to see those. The only reason we see them is because of the reverse electromotive force against their forward shooting fields. And everything here exploded. This is absolutely catastrophic amount of energy. And I think we can harvest it right there and get free energy. Now, let's look at this development of the neutrino, how it started as a particle, when it turned into its different phases, and when it exploded. All right, so Ms. Duffy was talking about having different phases of the muon neutrinos and electron neutrinos and here's the flat phase and here's the sideways phase and here is the concussion phase where we get the actual box now this is the main flow right there is the uh, venturi so these are the ones that are going to be impacting each other because they're stacking up at the venturi you look up in here you don't see any real nothing really going on down there a little bit here and there but not much because there's not much of a concussion here is where the real concussion is and you see these right here these have turned into their muon and electron neutrinos a little bit early this one has you see they're stacked up here but they're just outside that dead zone that's the bullet zone right there so that's where they're going to change most drastically and you can see it now outside of that range they're not being concussed as severely and when I say concussed why is why are they concussed what concussed them what, what is a venturi why did they separate here well this will add a little bit of I hope some you know it's a high high quality graphic there <laughs> all right so we have this particle coming in it's getting ready to stack up because it's trying to get through that little crack there. As you can see that? Yeah, okay. There's that little orifice, which is the venturi. The particle comes in in its box configuration here, but when it hits here, it explodes and divides. It's black and white, and only the white comes through as a shower. The black goes around, and here's where the shower starts right here. Now, let's look at it in its magnificence. All right, so here's a little closer shot. They're coming in, they're starting to stack up. The only ones that are changing their neutrino look is the ones that are in the center of this beam. Because, as I showed you, some of them change. In the outside here, you won't see any change at all. They're just sort of glowy white, red things. Here is where they split and divide into the black and the white. So it is complete division of the particles. And you have to tune it correctly to get that to happen. And they come back together exactly right there. You see that? They're coming back together as quick as they can. And that's a very short distance in light time. Um, so they're coming right back together like instantaneously. But we can see there is no question whatsoever. Zero question. Zero. When they came in, they were attached 
as the black and white ball side to side. I call those two bar magnets. They have mass. We never saw the dark matter before and you will never see it. You can't see it out here. The only way you can see it because of the Venturi. Now, the dark matter separated from the white matter, that's the muon neutrino separating from the electron neutrino. The electron neutrino causes showers. The muon neutrino came back to attach back to the electron shower neutrino once it became a Higgs field. Here they're turned into Higgs fields. Now, let me show you the actual what CERN wants to see, and it is exactly what I'm showing you here. Here's the split screen of it. All right, that's CERN, muon neutrino turned into a muon, which is no change at all. The electron neutrino turned into electron showers. Black ball, white ball. Black ball still, white showers. Black and white ball getting back together again. Literally, this is fission of the particles. They fissioned apart. They fused back together. You look that up and you'll find that that's what a nuclear reactor does. Now, is this that much energy? Well, sure looks like a hell of a lot of energy to me. All right, I think I showed you that crazy looking particle that was a, after I said a couple of Higgs fields crashed. Well, I'm just going to show you so that you understand what's going on here. The Higgs fields are when the particle, these fat, rapid particles of the electrons crash back into a, the standard atmosphere of where all your gases are and so forth. And they create these little spinning fields. They're Higgs fields. Now, imagine yourself standing right here, looking back this way. All right? The light's coming this way. You're looking into the orifice. You're going to see a brilliant white light. You're going to see white little strips coming out of there. And then you're going to see a bunch of fields show up right here. And here it is right there. We're looking into the Venturi, coming out at us. You see these? These are the actual, literally, the electrons. There's nothing attached to them except their whiteness. Bang! They create the Higgs fields. That's when, at that certain distance out, which I, you, you've seen it, the white spray comes out and then, boom, they start to, the blacks start to come back together. That's this area right here. This little particle right there, remember I showed you the really oddball looking one, and I'll show it to you again. I believe that this is the particle that crashed into another Higgs field out here and caused that really crazy looking little thing. Now, let me show you that. And then there's other interesting things here that light can actually crush other light and change its red frequency into a, a purple frequency and orange and all kinds of different things. It, it depends on how they interact with the other particles and what crushes them. This, this is a pinched particle. I have a better shot of that. All right, so now we're into this Higgs field where the crazy little particle came. And I believe that's where it starts to manifest itself. And then it's getting more glowy, apparently, because it's interacting with the field, is all I can assume. And then it does that thing, uh, that whatever that is, and it looks like it's a, it's a, <laughs> I'm not even gonna speculate. But this has some configuration to it. You see, it's got a side to it, and it's got the things coming down. I don't know. I think it's spinning backwards. They're supposed to have a right hand spin, and if they have a left hand spin, they're gonna interact obviously differently when they approach other light particles. Because the other light particles seem to just stay away from each other. This, whether it's a grabbed onto it, I don't know. I have no idea at this point. All right, this is that pinch shot where it pinched. And these are all red coming through, no question about it. When they come through, they're red coming from a red laser. That turned blue, and then it coming back to a different color. And it was pinched by this, these fields. Now, they, normally they stay apart from each other. What happened here, I'm not exactly certain, but you can see how evenly stay, they stay apart from each other because they have a field that says, you stay away from me, I'll stay away from you. We're good if we do this. All right? This one got crushed somehow, and I'm, I, I think it's, well, <laughs> again, this is so much to look at. But you can see, if you look at that little tiny dot right there in the center, that's literally the particle. 
and somehow it creates this magnetic because it comes through spinning you know because that's what particles do they spin they do not it's not a flappy wave it's a particle that has some propensity to spin like hell and the green spins faster than the red now um, and I can show you that right here green and red together all right now this is coming through the same venturi at the same time the red is completely overwhelmed by the green this is this is not another laser this is all those particles of red are so weak compared to the green that it just pushes them out of the way a couple little particles of red seem to have jumped up into there I don't know how but then you can see way back here the green reacts again so it would have probably never reacted at all here until it hit way out here because the green is much more powerful than the red and um, but it is the same particle you see there's the same particle there and um, and I have the green I have them in fabulous the green you can see very very well let me show you the green here Oops. see how nice you can see that green it's same as the red and again, these are the muon neutrinos, electron neutrinos. That's a bar magnet. That's a bar magnet. Back to back, upside down. That's it. Now, they see them. They say there's up spin and down spin. All they're seeing is the white on the left, white on the right. Because it'll spin. Yes, absolutely. As you can see in the red. You see? There's the white on the left. There's the white on the right. And the one it concusses is the one, see that's a top spin, that will concuss. That's a bottom spin, that will concuss on the bottom. And that's what they're seeing, they, what they, they're calling it, I don't know, what even, I'm not going to even say what they call things anymore. <laughs> but here's what they look like up close and personal. Uh, where is it? There, okay, this is what happens. You see that particle right there? That's the white. These are the blacks. That's another white. Well, that one's not concussed like that, is, is, is it? I mean, you can see that. I'm, I'm sure you can see that. There's no concussion around it at all. It's unconcussed. Well, that is concussed. And what is it concussing with? Well, it's concussing with the particles that it has to push out of its way. And what are those particles, Roger? Well, those particles are gases in this particular case because we are not in a vacuum we are just in normal everyday air so whatever is in front of it's got to get the hell out of the way I'm coming through I'm light and that's why things glow because anytime you push something against another magnetic particle it will glow just what happens now I, for that I cannot explain there's things I can't explain I'm, I'm not I'm not a genius at this I'm just seeing what I'm seeing I'm just pointing it out I'm saying this is what they want to see this is what it is if it's there it's there and I think it should be examined and I'm having a hard time getting through to anybody that will even discuss this with me so that's my issue right now I need to have somebody look at this and then we can move forward on this I mean that's what they're asking about at Fermi and I, I have I'd like to talk to Don Lincoln about it. Um, I'm having a hard time having him respond, but anyway, that's a whole other issue. But it's not; it is the issue. <laughs> so it's not a whole other issue. Anyway, this is what you're seeing. We're talking about neutrinos concussing, and the muons, and you know the whole nine yards. All right, this is undecided with Matt Farrell, and he's talking about these new. Perskovite solar cells could be the future of energy. Well, they are, and they don't realize how much of a future it has because it's, it's unbelievable. And, and what they're doing here is a solar panel. So the solar panel takes the electrons in, bashes them in, and creates holes, they say, and it flows the current through the load, which in this case is a, a light bulb. Now listen to what he has to say. Holes generating electric current. So why does this matter when we're talking about perovskites? Well, today the mainstream solar technology, silicon, is reaching its practical efficiency limit when used alone. The physicist William Shockley and Hans Joachim Quasier calculated the theoretical maximum efficiency of silicon single junction solar cells at around 30%. It's known as the Shockley-Quasier limit. Although there are gains made by multi-junction cells that combine multiple layers and techniques together, as I explained in a previous video, 
Another challenge is that silicon has to be fairly thick and manufactured with very high heat. But when it comes to perovskite solar cells, they don't require the heat and can be manufactured with much thinner layers. All right, I'm going to just cut right to the chase. Here's what he's talking about is these different layers of transition metals. Let me show you what transition metals are and why they absorb the electrons so well. Okay, currently in these perovskite cells, they're using titanium oxides, I believe. All of these other colors are other different transition metals, and you don't need thick layers of them, but they are a little bit, they're, they're not anywhere near as, as um, tough as solar cells, because they have to be manufactured. 25 year guarantee outside, they shoot balls the size of your fist at them of ice with a cannon and it doesn't break them. They hit them with huge sacks of sand and they just go blah, 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 and they don't break. They have to be made to a, a standard that's unbelievable. So they're expensive and they don't convert very well. 29, 30%. And it only has, I think, 22 is the tops they've ever got. So I think if we put thin layers, and here's what I'm talking about, is using all these different colored um, transition metals. The transition metals are right here in the middle of the periodic chart. And these are the things that move, and the reason they're so elegantly built for this job is that underneath the valence shell, a valence shell means the last outside layer of electrons, and they f f go in orbitals. So one little real close, and then a little further out, a little further out, a little further out. Well, and they always fill up everything until they get just to the outside. Well, not these. These leave a whole batch of holes down inside. So they can suck in a whole ton of electrons and flow them down. That's why we need to do, and here's how we could harvest free energy. I'm almost certain this will work. And it's a very, very simple to try. I just don't have the facilities to do it, otherwise I do it my own self. All you're taking is that little cheap laser. We're shooting it through a Venturi static device, nothing to do other than design it correctly. It creates that enormous increase in energy. We shoot it through all these different transition metals in thin films, and which will be absorbed into this substrate, and it goes down in through the battery or whatever collection device. It, it just shows that the storage of some sort. Up through whatever load we're going to use, run a car or a house or heat or whatever it is, and then back to the other side. So you can have batteries and have much as much power as you want. And this could be carried around in your own little handheld device. Very simple, and you could have tons, I mean tons of power. You saw the increase in energy. You have, you could just run a series of lasers, you know, and uh, I'm not talking any high-tech device here. The key is that these transition metals will absorb so many electrons, but they are not made to be out in the sunlight. They're made to be put in this little shoebox, which we're going to use to create energy. And then when they start to fail, and they may fail a lot sooner than the silicon. Silicon is guaranteed for 25 years. These here, they may last a year. Who knows? It may last six months. Who cares? They're cheap. You can build them for almost nothing. And they're just thin films. You just go shh, 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 with titanium, shh, 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 with copper, shh, 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 nickel, shh, 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 chromium, and brrr, there's your cell. Chop them up into wafers, put a back plate on the substrate, the collector, and then, you know, fuse a little, you may need a little bit of gold here or there to fuse weld things together to get the best conduction. But it, it, I'm talking ultra cheap stuff here. Nothing, nothing of any value whatsoever. You know, it, it, we're not talking about a big stretch to have handheld portable power in a shoebox with a couple of outlets in it. You take it into a disaster or plug it in, you're good to go. You take it out into Africa, plug it in, you got electricity. It's a game changer. And once this, if this was ever to be a realistic happen, it would change everything in the world because the, there would be no more fighting for resources because you can, you can make resources once you have energy. Energy is the key. All right, so let's think about it that way. Now I want to leave you last one last think. Okay, now Fermi Lab and all the rest of them. It's supposedly their mission is to act as scientific 
people to try to give us better energy and, and a better environment and all that. And I think I have shown that we can do this pretty in inexpensively. But here's what they did. They've spent billions and billions of dollars. And here's what they're about to do now to try to find the neutrino oscillations I think I just showed you. What is now the Sanford Underground Research Facility in South Dakota. Dune will have four far detectors, and each one will be roughly the size of the Nova far detector. These detectors will be filled with liquid argon, giving incredible resolution, so we can see the particles produced in the neutrino interaction to within a few millimeters. We're also building a completely new neutrino beam for Dune, which is going to be the most intense high-energy neutrino beam ever made. The combination of a really dense beam with enormous detectors means we'll get a lot of great data. All right, that's good. That's fabulous. I li I like the idea of doing research, and there's going to be a ton more research to do. Just try to look at th what I have presented. That's all. That's all I'm asking. And if it's if it's nonsense, it's nonsense. But I think I've shown exactly what they're looking for. We started with light. They're still using protons, which you're never going to get down to the size that you can see anything. Protons just smash gigantic particles and they see a lot of data. Yes, you're going to need a lot of data, but then you're never going to get to the end of what it actually means. So I'm, I'm hoping somebody will contact me. But I, I am on a lot of spam lists and, and lists that no, they think I'm a crazy person. Don Lincoln who thinks I'm a tinfoil hat guy, basically, is how his feeling about me is. And I, I, I think I need to be seen about, you know, this is government stuff. This is stuff that's trying to help us in our lives. And I think if anybody can present evidence to help us, then I, I, I if I was in this position, I would look at it. And that's all I'm asking for. All right, I love you all. Thank you. Have a nice day. All right, I just want to give credit to Rod Warren, who was the guy that came up with this just accidentally playing around, and he came up with a Venturi tr just trying to do the single. He was trying to do a double slip, but he was doing it using the single slip, and it ended up with this. And this was like seven years ago that I started with Rod, and these were the, some of the original pictures. Then we hooked up with some other people. Dil, um, well, his nephew Dylan is the most recent acquisition. <laughs> but we have um, Fabien Boule, I believe, was in France, and he highlighted some of these pictures. And um, here's, here's what he provided. Now, most of this is Rod. I believe all of this is Rod, but I, somebody highlighted these, and I'm not sure who it was. But um, I think it was Fabian, and uh, but you can see a, a lot of a, a, outstanding detail of th these are these particles, and then it w also it was um, this one here was uh, I believe again I, I'm almost sure this was uh, Fabian, uh, no, it was somebody else. Oh man, I'm sorry, whoever it was, whoever it is, oh boy, somebody that was traveling. And just sent me the pictures and said, you know, I, I whatever he did, he, he sent them to me. I, I hope the guy will, will kick in. I hate to miss anybody, but I have had very little interaction with anybody. Rod is the most that I've dealt with, and he's provided a lot of pictures. He just does it for fun. He's not into atomic stuff whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I talked to him the other day, so he doesn't want to be involved just go on your way basically but um, he's still doing all kinds of light experiments absolutely fabulous stuff but it's just for him it's just fun and that's where I find the most most you know credible research is people just doing it because they want to do it not because they're trying to beat somebody else or because they uh, have to do it to make money so anyway, Fabian uh, was fabulous. His stuff here, with his, his stuff was the green and the red particles and the red. I, I, he, he, yeah, he did a whole batch of stuff. Fab, Fabian was great. Fabian Boulay. Fabian, how you doing, buddy? And uh, most of this other stuff was Rod. And Dylan, he just came on board. And this is one of the latest ones from him. Look at this. <sighs> This is Rod's nephew. Look at this. I, I don't know what's going on out there. 
Look at that. I believe, and I again, I just got these, so I don't know. I don't know what to think. But I believe this is the moon, and he's taken something that's given us all the field effects. But you can look at every one of these. Everyone's a dipole. Everyone has a dipole. And they all have fields. Now, he, he said it's just something in his phone. He just takes it. He's only using a phone. And he sent me the settings and stuff. But you can see all of these fields, a dark and a white, dark and a white, dark and a white. Now, this, that's got me perplexed, to be perfectly honest with you, how these fields are interacting and what this is all about right here. And why is this stuff in front of the moon if this is the moon? And, and again, I just got it. I have no idea. There's a lot to look at now. All right? So anyway, Rod, Fabian, whoever else was involved, Renz in um, my buddy over in France, Bonjour Renz, he also sent me some stuff for you, just a little quick pics of something here and there. You know, they, nobody's ever been really involved in the in the research other than just, you know, sending me pictures of stuff. That they, they Fabulous stuff. And then I try to figure out what the heck is going on. Look at this. What the heck is going on there? And he said, you know, these new CMOS phones are absolutely phenomenal at what you can see. It's just stunning. And then, then the applications inside take them and they turn them into fields. And, <laughs> and this is as good as they're doing at CERN or anywhere else. I'm telling you that right now. And he, all he did, he's just a regular guy. He took a couple pictures and here, what do you think? Holy smokes, I think you just blew my mind. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a brave new world right now. A lot of things going to change which need to be changed. And we, I tell you, the changes could be absolutely phenomenal for the world if we could use this energy to get free energy. And, and I think we might be able to.